Jazz Club. Hello and welcome once again to Big Wrist Watches. I kicked off this channel with a few of the greats, but I also have some less expensive watches in my collection that merit at least as much attention. Most of these usually turn out to be Seiko's, as Seiko is a brand that I will love until the day I die. If you ask me what the best value is on the watch market, I would undoubtedly say Seiko. This Japanese brand has been making watches since 1881, which makes it older than well-known greats such as Breitling and Rolex. More importantly though, all of their watches have in-house movements. That is something that even big Swiss brands are still struggling to achieve. And indeed, Seiko is known for many iconic and truly legendary watches, one of which we are going to discuss today, the Seiko 6138-0040 Bullhead. But first, we need to talk about the 6138 movement that powers the Bullhead, because it has a story on its own. In 1964, upon receiving the honor of being the official timekeeper of the Olympic Games in Japan, the watchmaker responded by developing its very first chronograph. Five years later, Seiko followed up with the very first mass-produced automatic chronograph movement, the 6139. The 6139-6002 turned out, coincidentally, to be the very first automatic chronograph watch worn in space, and it was worn by William Polk. But since we just recently talked about watches in space extensively, I'll leave it at that for now. The 6138 movement in the bullhead was the successor of the 6139, contrary to what the number implies. And it's a real gem. It has a much desired column wheel actuated chronograph with a vertical clutch. It might not be nicely decorated, but what would be the point with the closed case back? But it makes up for it by being extremely reliable and accurate. Compared to the 6139, it now had a second register to count up to 12 hours and it also allowed to be hand wound. Seiko introduced the bullhead in the early 1970s, but it took until 73 for the first batch to be produced. There are two color schemes available, the blue-black version, such as mine, and the brown-red version. There was only one version of the blue one, called the Chronograph Automatic. But three versions were made of the brown one. The regular Chronograph Automatic, a Japan domestic market JDM 5 Sports speed timer version, and a normal speed timer version. Now as you can see, the bullhead's got its name thanks to the odd placement of the crown and pushers on the case. They are reminiscent to the handheld sports chronographs of the era and the placement is supposed to prevent accidental operation of the controls. That said, it's just a typically quirky 70s look, totally appropriate for the time and with a distinctive vintage vibe now. The case is very nicely made. There are a lot of small details with brushed and polished surfaces and it's truly a testament to Seiko's eyes for details. Something that cannot be said for all watch brands of the era. What was true then is still true today. If you buy a Seiko, you get more than what you pay for, in my humble opinion. Now, the design of the case does make it somewhat prone to accidents. You'll be hard pressed to find a bullhead in mint condition. And if you do, chances are it has been expertly refinished by a watchmaker. Most of them have quite a lot of knocks and scratches on the case and on the bezel too. The Hardlex mineral glass crystal also usually takes a beating, but luckily enough, those are easy and cheap to replace. The design of the dial is also quite striking, with the recessed subdials, white hands and the aggressive yellow center chronograph hand. It is the right combination of elegant and subdued, with that zesty yellow accent to tie it all together. The SUA logo on the bottom of the dial gives it a vintage flair, and the overall finish and design of it just clicks. On my specific bullhead, you'll see that everything is in original and in excellent condition, which is getting harder and harder to find. Then there's the classic fishbone bracelet. I wouldn't say it's the best bracelet Seiko ever made. And to be quite honest, I think the bracelets are the one thing Seiko still hasn't gotten quite right, even today. But the fishbone does look distinctive, and I wouldn't have any other bracelet on a bullhead since it's so iconic. But because of the single mini links that hold it all together, it flexes like mad. 
Amazingly though, the bracelet does manage to keep the watch head in its place on top of the wrist. And from a comfort perspective, it is not bad at all. The thing is though, that a bull head is a conversation starter. It's the kind of watch that you can't miss on a wrist. It has presence to spare and an own unmistakable identity, even when other watch brands such as Omega, Breitling and Citizen also made bullhead watches in that era. It's not the kind of watch you'll be able to wear under a suit, it will just not fit under the cuff of a shirt, but for any other occasion you just can't go wrong with a bullhead. Bullheads are steadily becoming more and more expensive even since quite a lot of them have been made between 1973 and 1983 when it was discontinued. I have had a few bullheads and every time I've had to pay considerably more than the previous time. It's just the kind of watch that I miss when I sell it, but I don't wear it that much when I own it. Yeah, those are the first world problems the watch collector faces in this life. <laughs> Anyway, I want to thank you again very much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please like and subscribe to the channel. Thanks again, and I hope I'll see you next time. Bye.